I'm here with Professor John Cam, Professor of Cardiology at St. George's University of London, who is joining me for this educational program today. John, welcome and thank you very much for being with us to discuss anti-anginal medications with a focus on, on ranolazine. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, in recent years, we've been, in a way, struggling with drugs to manage ischemic heart disease. But very recently, the armamentarium has actually grown quite significantly. So from having just nitrates and calcium channel blockers to treat and, and beta blockers to treat angina, now we have quite a few drugs. And the recent guidelines, ESC and NICE, have now incorporated as second line drugs um, ranolazine and several others. Uh, what is the reason for this? Well, I think the main reason for making a change in the guidelines is to recognize that these new antianginal drugs, particularly evabridine and ranolazine, have got a great deal to offer compared with older second-line therapies in particular, such as long-acting nitrates and nicarandyl. Beta blockers and calcium channel blockers are, of course, the first choice as an anti-anginal therapy for patients with chronic stable angina. Usually a beta blocker, for example, is chosen if the patient is appropriate. If that is not efficient, the patient may change to a calcium channel blocker, and the combination of beta blockade and calcium channel blockers may be considered. If those therapies are not adequate, then second-line therapy is now recommended. And second-line therapy means a choice between long-acting nitrates, nicarandyl, ranolazine, evabridine, or trimetazidine in those countries where that drug is approved. Now, I, I want to talk specifically about ranolazine because I think it is the first of the anti-anginal agents which is available to us in Britain and in most of Europe, which is not hemodynamically active. In other words, it neither reduces the blood pressure nor the heart rate, and nor does it impair left ventricular contraction. And so it is a completely different type of antianginal mechanism. Its action is to in inhibit the slow sodium current. Most of us know about the fast sodium current that activates myocardial cells and allows them to conduct electrical impulses. And we also know that uh, this change in voltage across the membrane releases calcium which is involved in the contraction of the heart. Most of us don't know much about the slow sodium current. After the fast peak of sodium current there is a trailing edge to this current which usually contributes about as much sodium intake into the cell as the peak current does. But under certain conditions, and ischemia is one of them, this current becomes very much greater. And because this leads to a high concentration of sodium within the cell, this causes a sodium-calcium exchange in the direction of bringing calcium into the cell. This increases the tension in the cell, and this increased tension, particularly in late systole and early diastole, tends to reduce coronary blood flow and make ischemia worse. So ischemia, in that sense, begets through this mechanism more ischemia. And ranolazine, which inhibits the slow sodium current, will interrupt this and reverse the ischemic pattern. Thank you for this, John. W w in terms of clinical evidence for the use, which has probably made ranolazine qualify for a position in the in the guidelines. What, what is the, how strong is the evidence we have? The evidence for ranolazine is pretty strong. You would not expect a new compound to be approved for the treatment of patients with chronic stable angina unless the evidence base were strong. Now with ranolazine, of course, 
as with other agents used to test angina pectoris. The main basis of the testing is, of course, an exercise tolerance test. When a patient with angina gets on a treadmill, for example, after some time, they develop changes in the electrocardiogram, they begin to complain of angina, and in the end, they can continue no longer. And those three parameters are usually used to assess whether an anti-anginal agent is effective. And that, of course, was done with renolazine in several studies for approval, there, were, there was the so-called Marissa study, which was a dose ranging study, a Carissa study that gave renolazine on top of either amlodipine, five milligrams, etanolol, 50 milligrams, or diltiazem, 180 milligrams. Then did exercise testing before and after renolazine, and in that case, with two dosing levels, 750 milligrams and 1,000 milligrams. In both the first study, the dose-ranging study, and the second study, this exercise testing showed a clear advantage, increased exercise durations associated with the use of renolazine. Now, there's a second stem to the investigation of these agents, which involved somewhat softer parameters such as the spontaneous angina frequency and the consumption of nitroglycerine. In both those first two studies, those parameters moved in the right direction. In other words, less spontaneous angina, less nitrate consumption. And the third study, Erica, was added, which investigated uh, 500 and then 1,000 milligrams twice a day of renolazine, and this was the clinching study in that it confirmed even with background therapy with amlodipine, 10 milligrams a day, in other words, optimal therapy with amlodipine, that renolazine improved angina management yet further. You have actually explored in a recent study the sort of combination of renolazine and other anti-anginals. What has been the conclusion of that study? Well, it's interesting that uh, there have not been many uh, systematic analyses of adding one anti-anginal therapy to another. And so we recently undertook a literature search to find papers that looked at adding one anti-anginal therapy to another and which also used exercise testing as the main parameter to assess the efficacy of the combination. The large proportion of studies, of course, involve the oldest antianginals, in other words, beta blockers and calcium antagonists. But there were other studies that looked at adding renolazine, for example, evabridine, trimetazidine, long-acting nitrates to beta blockers and to calcium antagonists, etc. Altogether, we found uh, 46 studies that were satisfactory for our analysis. And there were 71 combinations, I think, within those 46 studies. We were very impressed that the addition of beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, as we all knew from the past, did cause increased and improved antianginal therapy. And we were also very pleased to see that adding renolazine to either calcium channel blockers or beta blockers was also a very effective therapy and highly consistent in that not only was exercise tolerance improved, time to angina improved, time to ST segment depression improved, but also spontaneous angina frequency fell and nitrate consumption fell. Very consistent findings. With other combinations, the findings were not so consistent or not so numerous. So renolazine, in addition to another anti-anginal agent, proved to be a very highly successful combination. Excellent. And, uh, but, I mean, understandably, um, with a drug with a complex mechanism, mechanism of action relatively new, uh, general practitioners will be a bit sort of worried about initiating therapy with a drug like this in, 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 in primary care. What is the profile of the patient that you would 
sort of um, uh, identify as suitable for initiation therapy with ranolas in, 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 in clinical practice, in primary care, or in your own practice? Well, I think there are many patients who, for one reason or another, cannot or will not take beta blockers, and quite a few who are resistant to or do not tolerate calcium channel blockers. Well, that's the first line therapy, and if that cannot be used, then I think ranolazine is an excellent choice from those other, shall we call them, second line therapies. The general practitioner has to be sure that the patient does, ha ha does not have any severe hepatic disorders or moderately severe renal dysfunction, provided that those are not present and provided the patient isn't taking a class one or class three antiarrhythmic drug or a CYP3A4 uh, inhibitor, under those circumstances, ranolazine is an excellent choice. And it's given first at a low dose, 375 milligrams twice a day. You assess the efficacy and the tolerance to uh, that uh, therapy. If it's well tolerated, but it's not effective enough, you can increase it to 500 milligrams twice daily. And you can wait another two weeks and do the same again and go up to a maximum dose of 750 milligrams twice a week. And at this dosage, most patients who will respond to the therapy will do so. In terms of QT prolongation, which has been some of some concern, um, how do you actually deal with that problem? Well, if ranolazine were to be given to me, I don't have angina or heart failure, then my QT interval would prolong a little, maybe five milliseconds, something of that order. Nothing that most physicians could spot. But if you give uh, the drug to a patient who has got angina or has got heart failure, for example, the QT doesn't lengthen at all because the balancing effect on the slow sodium current takes away the QT prolongation. So it's relevant to consider in patients who are taking other drugs that prolong the QT interval, but otherwise you don't really have to worry about that at all. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.